This is a video log of our field trip to the St. Francis Mountains in Missouri during March 2011. The first stop was Pickle Creek Trail in Han State Park. The trail leads through an area rich in highly porphyritic granite pegmatite, which contacts a granodiorite gneiss. We're on Pickle Creek, which you can probably hear in the background, going this way, it goes downstream that way. And Pickle Creek exposes the Precambrian rocks in this area, and we're standing on a bunch of the granite. And there's also a, a Nysic unit and some dikes. And we're surrounded by some bluffs, which are like behind me here, that are the, made up of the Cambrian Lamont sandstone. There are several characteristic intrusive contacts showcased on this trail, including a large number of magmatic dikes into the granite, as well as xenoliths of varying size and shape. After leaving the Pickle Creek Trail, our next stop on the field trip was to the Oolitic Bonterre Dullestone, alongside the road at the intersection of Missouri 32 and US 67. The next stop was to the Shaley Davis Dolostone. This formation is primarily exposed in road cuts. This Dolostone is overlain by a Shaley layer, which has a greenish tint to it. Next was a trip to the discontinuity between Butler Hill granite and the overlying Cambrian Lamont sandstone. The granite has a well developed Rapakivi texture, as well as prominent joint sets. An Aplite dike follows the major joint directions and branches out into fractures. This particular feature is exposed in the west road cut, but may be difficult to find. Next on our trip was a stop at Knoblick Mountain. At this location lies an abandoned quarry which clearly demonstrates a contact between a rhyolite ash flow tuff and the Knoblick granite. The grassy mountain ignimbrite forms a roof pendant over the Butler Hill granite exposed to the west and the Knoblick and Slabtown granites that are exposed to the east of the rhyolite. Afterwards, we enjoyed seeing the mafic dike swarm in the Slabtown granite, which includes a fine-grained, dark purplish-red granite, potentially representing the chilled facies of a batholith. The swarm here is composed of small mafic dikes less than one inch wide, as well as epidote veinlets exposed on both sides of the road. This exposure includes 30 or more nearly vertical diabased dikes, believed to be part of a regional Precambrian structural feature. We then entered back into the Bonterre Dola Stone. Here small galena crystal studded the rock face on the far east end of the north side road cut. This outcrop is near Fridericktown, which is an important lead mining district from World War I until the 1960s. The old Hickory Nut Mine was located just a few hundred yards northeast of the location. Our next stop was to the previously mentioned Grassy Mountain Ignimbrite which is a massive rhyolite porphyry with well-developed joint sets on both sides of the road. Here, a four to five foot wide mafic dike intrudes along a prominent joint. On the south side, the dike was truncated by an overlying six foot thick boulder conglomerate. There is a noticeable dip where the dike and the conglomerate were once in contact. It is hypothesized that conglomerate is evidence for ancient talus weathering while the dip of the conglomerate suggests the dike was exposed to weathering before being buried by talus. Above the conglomerate bed is the sandy Bonterre Dolostone. At a new location, we witnessed flattened pumice in the grassy mountain Ignimbrite. Pumice shards are often ejected with ash and other debris during volcanic eruptions, and their compaction typically flattens the pumice into what we call fiamme. We stayed the night at Johnson's Shut-Ins and awoke the next morning to explore the park. Johnson's Shut-Ins is an erosional formation created when the otherwise meandering East Black Fork River enters into a restricted basin composed of four volcanic clastic rhyolite ash flow tufts. The shut-ins allow the flow rate of the river to increase considerably, which also increases the river's erosive power. This weathering force combined with the highly resistant rhyolite rock create the plunge pool, pothole, and chute features seen at the shut-ins. This park, however, has another story. 
On the morning of December 14, 2005, the Upper Tomsok Reservoir failed catastrophically, sending 1.3 billion gallons of water down the mountain through Johnson shut-ins in about 12 minutes. The water stripped the overlying soil down to bare rock and deposited many large boulders of granite, rhyolite, and dolomite in what is now called the boulder field. The park was closed for several years and finally reopened to full use in 2009. Evidence of this catastrophe, including the scour channel, the boulder field, massive rubble bars, and large fallen trees on high bluffs, can still be seen at the park. We then hiked through Elephant Rock State Park in the rain. This park is known for its large, round, Missouri red granite boulders. The roundness of the boulders is due to granitic sheeting. On site there is an old quarry which has some exposed xenoliths present. So what's up, Lauren? Things gonna get down there. So I was gonna say like, and then, if you guys lift me up like you're pulling, you know what I mean? Like yeah. actually lift me up. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? I do. Like, so come grab my arms. <laughs> After hiking around Elephant Rock State Park, we went to investigate team and shut-ins. Team and shut-ins. March 14th, Monday early afternoon, about 1, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Huge rainfall all night last night. And the team and shut-ins is just absolutely flooded. From where I'm standing here, we usually are able to get out about 200 feet out farther than this. Unfortunately, the excessive rainfall we received while we camped the night before at Johnson's shut-ins prevented us from seeing any of the rocks at our last stop. However, images from previous trips in years past show the rocks that can be seen here. The silver mine Pluton is exposed here and contains at least three generations of magma emplacement. The earliest two include a coarse-grained white to pink granite and a fine-grained gray granite. The contacts between these two units are not sharp, indicating they intruded at roughly the same time and were mingling together while still partially fluid. Both rocks at times seem to cross-cut each other. Pods of the fine-grained granite can be seen inside the coarse-grained rock. Yet, large feldspar grains from the coarse-grained granite appear to be included in the fine-grained material. Fine-grained pink rhyolite dikes cross-cut both of these earlier granites. Over the course of this trip, we saw numerous rock types in the Precambrian granite rhyolite province and the overlying early Paleozoic sedimentary rocks. Seeing these rocks and the contacts between them provided a great experience unavailable back home in the glacial deposits and dolomite of the Kankakee Basin.